I was a small child, I used to sit with my grandmother and look at the night sky. We used to try and count the stars. That love of the night sky has led me to a career in astrophysics. But unlike when I was a child, it's not the optical part of the spectrum that I'm using to study the universe. I'm a radio astronomer, and I use arrays of radio telescopes to literally map the universe in a new light. Here are some of the radio telescopes that I've been fortunate to use in my career. These are located all over the world. Some people believe that radio telescopes cannot make astonishingly beautiful images of the heavens. I think those people are wrong. This is an image made in New Zealand by members of my team in Wellington. And it's data taken with a telescope in Western Australia called the Murchison Widefield Array. And you're seeing our Milky Way galaxy in three radio colors. You can see beautiful blue glowing hydrogen gas clouds. You can see these amazing yellow globe-like features. They're supernova remnants. That's the remains of the most spectacular way that a star can die. And there's much fascinating and amazing science to be extracted from this image, which we can look at um, in many different ways. But it's not that science that I'm here to talk to you about. I'm here today to talk to you about the way we do that extraction and how it needs to change. See, astronomers are driven to map more and more of the universe in greater and greater detail. And to do that, we need to build bigger and better telescopes which collect ever more data, giving us a big data problem. In my lifetime alone, I've worked on the design and construction of three major radio telescope projects. The Low Frequency Array in the Netherlands, the Murchison Widefield Array in Australia, and the Square Chronometer Array, or SKA, which will be built in Australia and South Africa. Now, many people in New Zealand know about the SKA telescope because we're a partner country in that project. And was originally, we were originally bid, bidding with Australia to host some of the SKA infrastructure here in the South Island. Unfortunately, the New Zealand part of the project did not uh, survive the rigorous site selection process, but that doesn't matter. New Zealand is involved in a project to build the world's largest radio telescope. It is a project of the scale and complexity of the Large Hadron Collider. So the SKA uh, itself involves 10 countries, 500 scientists and engineers around the world, and will build 130,000 antennas in Australia and 200 dishes in South Africa. There are many science goals for the SKA project, but I like to sum them all up by saying that we are building a device to make the fastest uh, frame rate, highest resolution movie of the evolving universe ever. Yeah. Now, <laughs> those of you that work with video know that it uses a lot of data. And the SKA is no different. It is a mammoth data collecting device. And for this reason, the computers that we need to process the data do not yet exist. So I'm serious. <laughs> um, companies like IBM, NVIDIA, Intel are interested in partnering us to solve what is going to be the ultimate big data challenge. So when I say ultimate big data challenge, it really is. So when we switch the SKA on in a few years, it will collect 160 terabytes of data per second. Yeah. That is the equivalent of 35,000 DVDs per second. Now, that's the raw data rate. Um, and we process that down, and we still end up with about one petabyte of imaging data per day. And people say, that's great. You got one petabyte of imaging data per day. But data is not knowledge. And so we have to sift through that data and actually transform it into something that we can do science with. Now, traditionally, the way that this was done is a process called eyeballing, which is literally where people look at images and then write down the positions of interesting sources. Here you see a group of women computers at Harvard University in 1900. And you see them holding magnifying glasses and looking at optical plates from a telescope, and you see them writing things down in a ledger. So this is eyeballing. 
And my first job in astrophysics 20 years ago was pretty much exactly the same. I was hired to look at optical plates with a magnifying glass and write down the position of a particular type of source called a planetary nebula if I happened to find them. Now, computing has moved on in 20 years, so you would hope that this is not the way that we still do science, right? Well, while we do have algorithms that can do some of the automatic source detection classification that we need to do in images, it turns out that the human eye and our visual perception system is the most precise and complicated visual perception system that we have access to. And so we do not yet have anything that can fully replace the human eye. So to give you an example of uh, what computers can and can't do in terms of astronomical source detection, I wanna show you this image. This is an image of three quarters of the sky taken with the MWA telescope. It was released two days ago. Um, my team uh, have been working with an international team for the last three years to make this image. This shows you three radio colors. You can see the band in the center, that's our galaxy, the Milky Way, and it's awash with radio emission. And then you can see lots of little dots. Every single one of those little dots is a radio galaxy which houses a supermassive black hole. That is a black hole with at least a million times the mass of our sun. Every single dot. Right, now, it would have been impossible to count all of these dots by eye, and we didn't. We used a computer, and we used what's called a thresholding algorithm. Now, thresholding algorithms at their core are very simple. What they do is they look for collections of pixels, which are together, and above some brightness intensity, above a threshold. So if we zoom in, let's have a look at this region here. That's zoomed in there, we're gonna zoom in again, and then one more time, this time only in one radio color. So that image in orange is showing you a supernova remnant and a bunch of point sources which, remember, have supermassive black holes at their core. If we look at the pixel intensity distribution through a line in one dimension through that image, it looks like this. And so you can see there's clearly some peaks there. So I can say to a computer, tell me how many of those things are above that red line, and it'll happily do that. And so that's what a thresholding algorithm does, and we ran that over that image that you saw previously to find 327,000 radio galaxies. But you'll notice in the colored image behind me that there's more to that image than just the dots and the bright things. There's kind of fuzzy, diffuse patches of stuff. So what about that? So let's see how a thresholding algorithm does with those type of things, but first, I'm gonna to have to tell you about the anatomy of a radio galaxy. So this is a radio galaxy. If I could zoom into every one of those dots on that image and show you at full resolution, it would look like this. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope image in the background with a radio image with that purple stuff over the top. And what you see is a galaxy in the center and then two huge jets of radio emission. Those jets are the results of electrons being flung out of the center of that galaxy, traveling at about 97% the speed of light. They're embedded in a magnetic field, and they give rise to radio emission, which we detect with our telescope. So, to give you a sense of scale, objects like this are millions of light years across. So, even traveling at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, it would still take you over a million years to get from one end of the object to the other. They're big. Okay, so you have to remember what a radio galaxy looks like. It's got a core and two lobes. This one is very bright, and so it's very easy for an algorithm to find. But what about if they're not so bright, if they're faint? Here's an example. This is real radio data of a radio galaxy, and hopefully you can see at the back and at the top of the room that there are two patches of very faint, fuzzy, diffuse emission. Those are the lobes of the radio galaxy. If I run a thresholding algorithm on it, this is what I get, the blue squares. It totally misses the lobes of the radio galaxy. And so it misses a huge amount of the most interesting objects that we're looking for in these radio surveys. So how do we account for this now? We're still eyeballing. <laughs> these are my uh, research assistants, and they've just spent the last three months looking at that radio image of three quarters of the sky to find the things that were missed by the cataloging algorithm. So, all right, you might say, 
four people, three months, one person a year for a survey, that's not bad. The problem is that the surveys that we're going to do with the SKA will require 350,000 times more data. And I don't think anyone's going to give me 350,000 research assistants. So <laughs> we need better algorithms. So what I've been working on with my colleagues, uh, Marcus Frey and Chris Hollett and Tony Butler Yeoman on, is new algorithms to solve this problem for us. And I'm here today to show you the first results. So we've been working on an algorithm for four years. Uh, after a few failed starts, we finally arrived at something which we think does a reasonable job of mimicking what your eye does in looking at that whole image and then finding where those fuzzy lobes are. We call it oddity. So let's see how it does. So here's our radio galaxy again. Here's what we get when we use a thresholding algorithm. And here is what we get with oddity. So as you can see, it detects the radio lobes. It has a 95% accuracy, and it is almost as good as me. And I have 20 years training at looking at these images and finding these fuzzy things. So this is cool. This, this makes our life easy. Now, you might say, OK, that's cool. You can, you can find radio galaxies. Awesome. Um, but it turns out, <laughs> it turns out this is a class of problems that occurs in many places, in many fields. So if you think of radiologists who have to be trained to look at ultrasound images to look for small uh, new regions which might indicate early signs of cancer or people looking at geophysics images for magnetic anomalies, these are all similar things. In fact, here are some examples which show um, what's happening in terms of uh, different areas. So this is a NASA image of Mars and those black regions are where geyser-like activity happens through sublimation. People are trying to count those by hand. This is a cryo-electron microscope image of a protein or proteins, and people are counting all those little dots by hand. This is my favorite. This is a droplet of seawater with plankton, and some poor researcher has gone and drawn all the plankton on by hand. Yeah, there's a lot of seawater, so that's a lot of plankton if you want to start cataloging that. In fact, these guys tried to do it with an algorithm too, and that's what they got. They found all of their plankton, but they also found lots of other stuff, and that highlights the difficulties of this type of field. So astronomy is leading the way in dealing with these problems for the big data space, but if we really want to find um, things in all these other fields and turn data into knowledge, we need algorithms like Oddity to do that, and it will enhance not just my ability to find radio galaxies, but many other fields. So here I am, 40 years later, still trying to count the stars, but this time doing it in a much better machine-aided way. Thank you.